when you are producing something, any work that you do, people work hard, they get exhausted, things happen, you have checklists, but you will still find that some mistakes will slip through. How can we create a process so that these mistakes do not happen again? It is okay to make mistakes once, but do not keep making the same mistakes again and again. So, that is where Poka Yoke was intro introduced. Poka means inadvertent mistake and Yoke means prevent. How can we prevent mistakes from happening? Let us look at, uh, before we get into examples, I will just sort of quickly classify the two types of Poka Yokes that exist and once you see them, you will be able to start connecting the dots together. There are two types of Poka Yoke devices. The first one is what is called control Poka Yoke and the second one is what is called warning Poka Yoke. Now, in a control Poka Yoke, the process is designed in such a manner that you would not be able to make a mistake. You would actually go through the process step by step yourself without even realizing what is going on, what is happening and you would get the right thing done. There is no chance of an error occurring in that process. And the other process is a warning Poka Yoke, which means that the moment the error occurs, it is going to flash some sort of a message to you or some sort of a warning to you to tell you, oops, looks like you made a mistake. Right? So, these are these two categories. Ideally, in, a, in, an, in an ideal world, we would like things to never go wrong, right? So, we would try and aim for control poker yokes as much as possible, but you would automatically, as we proceed through the talk, realize instances where it makes more sense to have warning poker yokes rather than having control poker yokes. So, let us look at uh, some of the examples uh, in the manufacturing industry. Let us say uh, I have uh, an, uh, the engine which is going to be very hot. I have some sort of a component that is really hot. And I want to make sure that I make use of bolts which are heat resistant. But I have other bolts also which I am using for my manufacturing process, right? How do I ensure that the worker does not go and screw on the wrong bolt? You will screw on the wrong bolt, everything will work fine right now. But after some point in time when it gets hot, that bolt is going to break, crack, melt, something is going to happen. So, you are going to go and have to check, right, later down the line, okay, did the guys use the, the right bolt? So, what you would do? A simple solution most of us will come up with, let us color code it, right? So, let us color code the bolt and I will immediately know. But what if a person is so, there are people by the way who cannot distinguish colors. You would not even come to know, but there are people, it was it's difficult to believe. So, a, a more elegant solution to this is make the size of the bolt slightly different from all the other bolts. That is quite simple. Now, now he is not going to be able to put the wrong bolt in. It's, it becomes a control poker yoke mechanism. So, you make special the heat resistant bolts which are most likely going to be the more expensive components of your parts slightly different in size from all the other bolts it will work both ways those bolts will not fit in a low expensive place and it will also work in the right place right so it it, it, it sort of has a nice healthy side effect another uh, interesting example is uh, in 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 a in a car manufacturing uh, uh, plant you don't have different conveyor belts for different cars it just does not make any sense for manufacturers to do that. It is the same conveyor belt, but different models of the cars are coming down the same belt. Now, depending on which model it is, it is going to have a different tire, of course, and then the bolts that go on that tire need to be tightened based on which and what is the size of that tire. Now, how can you test if that bolt is, is tightened just right? There are chances that you can tighten a bolt too much and when the car is on the road, it will go over a speed breaker. After 2500 speed breakers, it will crack because it was tightened too much or maybe it is too, it is not been tightened enough and it will come off by itself. How do you check for something tight enough? It is weird, right? It is not an easy problem to solve. How do you check for something that is just tight right, right? So, what, the, what uh, car manufacturers do, they have this torque gun and this torque gun is pre-connected to a control system. So, when that car comes down, this torque gun actually gets a set point which says you only have to tighten it this much and the person does not get any control to choose how long to press it. The moment he presses it, that torque just goes to that much amount of level and switches off. You can keep it pressed, it makes no difference. You can leave it early, it would still go on for the full line. So, that is again a control Pukayok mechanism. It is sort of ensuring that the bolt is tightened just right as much as needs to be tightened and not more. Let us look at uh, in an ER room. These are the various gases that are usually you can see in, in common ER rooms which are needed during an emergency, nitrous oxide, medical oxide, vacuum and so on. Obviously, you do not want the doctor in an emergency to put vacuum, right, if you need oxygen. So, they have color coded it. But if you look more closely, you also want to make sure that when these pipes are connected, they are not connected to the wrong one, right. So, the guy who has to make these connections has to make sure he does them right. And and that is where what is called the pin index safety system comes into play. So, you see these, these arrangements here 
which are in different angles, the pins, these pins are different and they have been standardized. So, you cannot go and plug in something wrong into the wrong socket. Again, a control Pokayog mechanism. You can only plug the right thing into the right socket. This is should be a much more familiar example. The problem, what is the problem here? The problem is you do not want a car to have all your luggage on it, 40 kgs for people coming from abroad to India and then you put it on the cart and then it goes, travels. You want to make sure that the cart stops, but you do not want to bring in a mechanism that people have to remember to push a pull a brake, push a pull a brake. In, you know right, we heard Venkat's story today of how he sidelined the treadmill. So, if you do not want to push and pull, you are going to forget to put it on and it will still slide. You want a mechanism that is part of your process. What is the process? I have once I put stuff on the, on, on the cart, I want to push it. The push mechanism itself is going to happen irrespective of your poker yoke. So, let us put it in between. So, when you push the cart, it will unlock itself and you can take it. When you let go of the cart, it stops there. Another control poker yoke mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is the idea. See what would happen if you make this a control poker yoke, right? You are saying I do not trust the judgment of the person. I am letting go of all the independence of thought that you have. I am taking over now. I am putting you in a framework boundary and saying this boundary is what you live in. If I am in a hurry, if, I, if there is an emergency and my car is not starting now just because I cannot put on a seat belt and there are reasons where you will not be able to put on a seat belt, that is just not acceptable. I am not taking this car. You do not want to lose control. You want to bring in poker yoke at the right time. So, you have to be pragmatic. You cannot let go of your thought process. It has to be, you still have to give people the independence of choosing it. So, a warning poker yoke in this, in this fashion. So, now that we have seen uh, some examples in the real world, let us switch over to software and see what happens in software when these things get translated. <coughs> what I am going to do, I am going to first show you UI design software for end users and how poker yokes have been implemented for end users and then we will switch over to how development teams can use them for making stuff even better. Here is your first example, <coughs> creating a password, uh, something that most of us might be familiar with. You see a double box, the double box is there for what reason? To make sure that you do not make a mistake when you are entering it. You cannot see your password, right? Let us say you entered something and then you do not know what it was that you entered. Very simple poker yoke. Look at the other one on the left side, the password strength. That is very interesting. The password strength is telling you the strength while you are typing and this is very important. You might think of yourself as very smart. This is a very cool password. It is uh, nobody will be able to guess it, but you do not actually have the real data of what are the kinds of passwords that people actually create and what is it that is common and what is not common, but that is data that these applications have. The cloud knows that what is it that most people are using, what is it that is common and what is it that can be broken. Well, there is a, a, a sort of libraries that can check for what is called lead speak, L-E-E-T and L-E-E-T itself can be, is usually written as 1337 because it looks like L-E-E-T. Lead speak consists of vocabulary of words where uh, you replace normal characters with ASCII symbols or with numbers and people seem to do that very frequently thinking that oh, it is so, it's so smart, right? Like secret can be written as S3CR3T. It is a lead speak vocabulary word. It can easily be broken, there is nothing about it and there are lots and lots of such uh, libraries that can catch these things. So, definitely it, a secret is a weaker password than S3CR3T, but it is not strong enough and that is something that these guys will tell you that you are not using a strong password, it is so obvious because you are using lead speak and that is where you are helping end users from mistake proofing. They are not doing it intentionally. These mistakes are not intentional mistakes, there are mistakes that are happening while you are sort of and you are thinking from the end user's perspective while designing your software. You do not want them to make a mistake, so you mistake proof it. This is another very interesting example. This was an example that I actually emailed to Google when I was using Gmail lots of years back saying you know what, I have done this a multiple number of times that I would write a sentence saying I have attached the following document for you to check, let me know if it looks good and I forgot to attach, right? It has happened to most of us. I was pretty surprised to see that feature there after almost six months after I wrote that email. You send this and you get this message right now. It says you wrote I have attached in your message, but there are no files attached. Send it anyway. Mistake proofing, right? <coughs> Another one. It will make you sound weird, but this is also an example that I had emailed them on the same day along with attachment because I had done this too. I had John in two different companies as my customers and when I sent mail, I sent it to the wrong John, right? 
but I told, I, I was like, you know what, the email software knows, it knows that I keep sending mails to this group so frequently that I had to send it to that John, why did it send it, if I have chosen a different John, can't you tell me, you know what, this is not the group John that you usually send to, did you mean the other John? Yes, uh, I guess I'm saying give me this feature and read my mails, I don't care, you know, it's, it's like that. But I agree with you, definitely, definitely that makes sense. So the idea is to understand the thought process of your customers and see what is it that are the mistakes that they make and then try and fix them, right? Try and help them not make these mistakes, that's when they love your software way more. There are a lot of other examples but for because of sake of time, I am now going to skip into development so that we get more deep inside, take a step by step. So the thing I wanted to talk about today, which is actually something that I am a lot more passionate about uh, in Poka Yokes, is uh, when we work as teams. Teams nowadays, have, have you heard of this term distributed agile? It has become like the next buzzword. So agile was one buzzword, earlier it came in, then distributed agile came in and there are newer ones. I just won't say them right now. <laughs> but distributed agile basically means these things to people. When they think of distributed agile, all they are saying is we are going to encounter these challenges and we are going to do, do very well through these challenges. And it is a common thing, even if you do not think distributed agile, if you think of big teams, remote teams, people sitting here and there, a lot of times you create checklists or you write an email with a bold font and you say, you know what, make sure next time when you do something like this, do not do this, this, this or this or make sure before you send this. Or, or test this out or check this, do these four things. Until you do not do these four things, do not send something out. These are indicators for you to think about poker yokes. And these are things that I am going to show you how it works. So the idea is, you want to make sure that in a team people do not make mistakes and do not repeat mistakes that you already know can occur. Right? Those are the things you want to avoid. So simple things, unit test, it is like classic poker yoking. It has got all those features of what a good poker yoke is supposed to have. It is supposed to be precise. The moment it breaks, you should be able to come to know what is happening. It should be light, it should be easy to maintain. Yes, I know that there are unit tests that do not meet these criteria. Those are bad unit tests and that means those are bad poker yokes. But unit tests mean this, right? unit tests means that the moment things break, I am going to tell you. That is the quality of a poker yoke. The moment something breaks, it should tell you at that point. It should not come after three days, you know what, you did something wrong. That is not a poker yoke anymore. Poker yokes have to be early, they have to be precise. Build radiators coupled with unit tests, coupled with CI servers. The moment you check in code, you should immediately see a green or a red light. And it's immediate is the important point, not after 60 minutes or 45 minutes. Immediate means immediate means something that people will not just walk away from after checking. Usually that's under five minutes. If un if within five minutes I don't know what's happening, it's not a poker yoke, it's not going to help you, people will walk away, right? <coughs> IDs, warning poker yokes, while you are writing, they will tell you. Simple examples that we can relate to. Let's Let's look at more examples. Compilers are obvious. Uh, they will tell you that you made a mistake, but take it to the next level. Think of uh, statically typed languages. Think of Scala. There are things that you can do with compilers nowadays. For instance, they can check your SQL query against the database at compile time and tell you that your SQL query is wrong. Those are not things you could have done earlier, but there are, there are features like that that are available to check right at compile time that your SQL query is wrong. Think of check-ins and think of the things you ask developers to look at before you check-in. A check-in requires you to make sure that you have put a comment, make sure you put the Jira issue ID, make sure that if you are pair programming, both the developers' names are there because that's not going to be caught by, by any of the version control systems. Make sure you don't check-in when the build is read. Make sure that you run all the unit tests, check-in into VCS, right? These are things we have a checklist for. Most people just have to follow these and a lot of us don't do it. One or the other thing slips through. But instead of that, a lot of teams, what they do, they have a pre-commit script. It is the script's job to actually find out all of these. It will ask you to enter the message. The pre-commit script will ask you for the issue number. It will ask you to enter the developer's name. It will also go and verify first whether the build is read or not. If it is already read, it will disallow your check-in. These are the things and it can also check for new files. So many times we have <laughs> done a check-in and new files have, have just gone through, right? Why, why should your team keep making the same mistakes again and again? Ask the team to create a pre-commit script and use that script across projects, not just on your project. And we do it all the time at ThoughtWorks. Autosave, obvious control, Pokayok, right? <coughs> okay, now these were certain examples. Uh, what I wanted to go next into was architectural examples of Pokayok. How can you create architectures 
which will ensure that your system is mistake proof. Your system and developers who are using these architectures, who are writing code in these <coughs> architectures, they don't just go in and do whatever and then it blows up back on your face. And especially for things that you know blow up. So one example for instance is the HTTP session. How many people here know what is an HTTP session? Just before I, okay, there are people who are familiar, all right. So an HTTP session is actually supposed to be used for session, right? You're supposed to use an HTTP session to identify session. You're not supposed to use an HTTP session like a knapsack bag in which you just go and stuff everything into it and pass it on around in pages. Agreed? Lots of problems there. First of all, you don't know who all has stuffed whatever into a HTTP session. Then when you get into clustering, you have to keep all these sessions all the synchronized so that it, the, when the request goes to some other server, you want things to go right. So you don't want people to do this. So what do you do? You take away that ability to do this, right? You create a framework for your own team and you say that you will not get access to HTTP session. You will have a method which says get session ID because that's what you <coughs> need. And for everything else that you want to do, I'm, you're going to have to call the appropriate data structure. Go find out what is the appropriate data structure for doing credit card storage or for storing the username or for storing the color of the last page that I visited. But don't put it in the HTTP session. So think about the problems and, and remove the control away then in that case. If you are working in a team where people don't understand this, you have to understand the context. Don't apply any of this without context. If your team is smart enough, all of them understand that they are never supposed to use HTTP session for this purpose. Don't waste your time creating a poker yoke. Okay. Similarly, context specific injections. If you know the context of your application, if you know that this is let's say a get context, that means I'm performing a get operation. You do not want any updates to happen to your system, right? Rest, don't, don't make any updates. HTTP says get call, that means read only call. So think about this and say what can I do to make sure that people are not going to write code that will go and update the system. One example of not is giving a read only database connection. That's quite easy, right? Nowadays, you can create a, a session and a Hibernate session and say this is only a read only Hibernate session. So when it's a get call, I will inject only a session that has only read only capability. You can go and call any API you want to call as a developer. Eventually, it will never get committed. It, it depends, uh, yes, it, and that's something you will have to decide based on your context whether you would like an error to be thrown or not. In some cases, you may not. In some cases, you may, right? If the developer knows now, you know what, my, my, my tech lead is smart enough and he has already taken care of all these things. I don't care. I can go and call these three, four APIs because my code becomes much cleaner by calling them in this sequence. I can reuse certain method. Don't worry. Even though this was supposed to go and update, it will not update because it's, it's a read-only connection. So sometimes people work around this, right? They sort of become a little lazy, but you know it's okay. They can do it. If the code becomes more readable, the trade-off is acceptable, right? So context-specific injection, uh, understanding the context, and putting, inserting uh, the services using DI or whatever to make sure that they are correct. He go, doesn't go and update and call services which you don't want to call. Understand the context. For instance, Rails allows you to do things like, uh, you can say, am I in dev context, am I in test context, am I in production context. Based on the context, automatically the right services get injected. You don't have to write your if codes, or oh, if this, if that, and then again figure out the whole thing, again make a mistake. The, the, the architecture is taking care for you for this. Run under least privilege, very famous. Run under least privilege says that you should make sure that your application, your process should always be running under the lowest possible privilege so that somebody doesn't come in and go as a hijacks your system. Operating systems do this all the time. They make sure that the process that is created, it has the lowest level privilege so that if a virus comes in or if, a, if something comes in, takes over your process, it will have no access to be able to write anywhere outside its memory area. You're, make, you're helping the developers and the people who are writing the program from not having to worry about these mistakes or these issues or these things that you have already solved, right? Another example of running under least privilege, which a lot of people seem to forget for some reason, is making sure that your database connection does not have DBA or admin rights, right? Your database connection for an app only needs to access this, these three tables, then it should only have access to those three tables. Even if you get SQL injected, it makes no difference. Let, let them come to know these three data, okay. Let's say whatever, it, at least it's much lesser. They're not going to go and wipe out the rest of your database because the original connection that they have itself doesn't have access to other things, right? So, so try and sort of think through some of these things. If yours is a reporting application, it doesn't need update access to the database. Why should the connection have an update right itself? 
give it a read only access to the database run under least privilege yeah so unfortunately most of the answers to such questions are it depends right like so it depends on on what is it that you want to achieve so let's let's just uh, let me answer this question in a in an indirect manner when should you use a poka yoke right you should use a poka yoke in two situations one situation is if you think that mistake is happening too frequently right so if you can are actually seeing issues occurring like these too frequently and you know that your team is messing it up then you'll have to bring in a poka yoke or you will have to keep suffer the consequences right so if you see if you see in your application this issue and you say okay okay looks like we need a poka yoke that's when you will separate the connection pools if you feel that you don't need it just don't go ahead and do it don't like don't create rules like you have to every step you take in your in your development process as well as in your life has to be based, based on not rules but pragmatism right you have to decide based on your current situation what is it that you want to do next and don't rules are there to help you to make the next decision so the, the second reason why you would do a poka yoke is if the blast radius is very large of that issue it may not happen many times but if it happens even once you screwed right so for for example what would be a blast radius nice if you think the password gets logged in a log file or if you think something will will slip through even if it happens once you know you don't want that to happen it's just bad reputation for your company or for your project then you must put in a poka yoke right you must put in that check says this should never go through because i cannot afford it to go through if you think it's happened too many times that's your second clue don't put in a uh, that you need to put in a poka yoke how many people here have heard of the circuit breaker pattern okay so there is this very nice book called release it by michael nagar uh, you must read that book even if not for circuit breaker just like go ahead and read it it will tell you about how to release software and how to create software that is production ready there is a very good explanation and that's where this pattern was uh, introduced it's called the circuit breaker pattern a uh, circuit breaker pattern is very much like in your house you have a circuit bre breaker the moment too much electricity travels through it the circuit breaker opens itself so that nothing more happens what does it do it saves the rest of your house right that's the, that's the idea right so it's a, it's exactly the same pattern in programming that is used and it's actually it's it's now become very very common you will find most frameworks and uh, and most uh, production systems implementing the circuit breaker pattern the idea is if you have a service on this side and this and the, there is a circuit breaker put in between the job of the circuit breaker is to detect that at any point in time if this call to service fails for instance it times out or it doesn't give a response or it throws an exception the circuit breaker will op will open up what this means is that after this point in time when the circuit breaker has opened any calls to that service will immediately be be returned with an exception saying i am right now open or there is something wrong with the service how does this help this helps both the people it helps the person who's calling immediately come to know that this service is down instead of getting blocked that oh after 2 minutes i'll get a response so oh, after 3 minutes i might get it. and you will have a flurry of requests coming from this side all of them waiting for the service to open right but now because there is a circuit breaker it's immediately returning things back and not locking down this system not locking this person down how does it help the person on this side the app is the service on this side gets a lot of time to recover right now it's already under problem and then you coming in and sending me request one after the other one after the other what do you think is going to happen to the service the whole system here will also go down and this system will get blocked so what what the circuit breaker pattern does is it opens itself up for a specific period of time and for that period of time it will not allow anybody to go in it could be set to 2 minutes it could be set to 3 minutes that will depend on whether your system on this side has a capability to recover and what do you think that time is after that point in time it will again close and it'll allow one service one of uh, one call to go in it's called the half open state or the half closed state it's it's the same thing it's like a half cup so it goes half down and it allows only one call to go through if that call succeeds it will fully shut itself then saying okay looks like the system is back on if that single call doesn't succeed it will again open back back itself up and it's a pretty good pattern it's mistake proofing both the systems it's ensuring things don't blow up it's making sure that you don't have to worry about such issues and things are taken care of for yourself you can implement them in many mechanisms there's a very nice elegant uh, aspect oriented way of implementing it so that you can put aspects around the the service method calls itself and you don't have to make it as part of the individual code another example is primitives versus types um 
you can go around passing primitives you can say this is a money value for instance or you can say this is a string that holds something or this is a number that holds something as an api designer i can return a number i can return a string the problem with doing things like this is you have you lose control over that value the moment you return something now another developer is free to go and update whatever it wants to do to it but if there is a business logic that is associated with it and if you actually wrap it up into an object and only expose methods that will make sure that the consistency of this value doesn't change then you are ensuring that once i pass something on down to somebody else those developers the coders were using this value they're not going to go and mess up with it because they don't have any methods to go and mess up with it right that's the idea of using a type rather than using a primitive even better which is something that even venkat talked about in some sense today was immutability if your objects are being returned in a manner that they are immutable which means that you cannot modify their states then you can be 100% sure that none of the developers none of the code none of the apis or the lines which are using this object after you return are actually ever going to modify its value and therefore what you are returning is always going to remain consistent with what's going through right <coughs> um some more interesting examples uh, password log check another very common problem people will go ahead and log credit card numbers while debugging they might log passwords while debugging they might log a cvv number by debugging but they just put a printf and statement for some other reason they weren't sure and they forgot to take it out and it got checked in how do you sort of make sure this doesn't happen right you want to mistake proof this error one idea uh, for this is uh, automation if you have functional automation or any form of automation in place you will find that most of the testers and the testing team will use the same sets of passwords and uh, credit card numbers for their testing maybe a set of 5 set of 6 but that's it it's a small set you can easily go and check and grab the log files periodically of the automated machine to make sure that that set does not exist in any of your log files right so for in you because you know that these are the sets that are running through these are the sets that are going through you know that this is the credit card number being used just just write uh, as part of your automated testing after the testing uh, is done one pokayog script its job is only to check that none of the passwords have gotten logged right and you can catch that immediately live data testing and very interesting example i'd like to share here uh i used to work on a travel project and uh, very interestingly uh, and don't ask me the reasons but it's true for many travel companies they do not have access to testing services when they do flight bookings for testing they are actually doing live bookings so we were actually hitting the real gdss for all our testing and it's not just a problem we had with one travel customer it seems it's a problem across travel companies people who worked in the travel domain will share their experience with you on how it is when you are actually doing testing against live data and what are the precautions that you have to take while testing against live data so we had this email given to us which used to say make sure your test bookings are at least 3 to 6 months in advance make sure that they are not around any of the holiday season which means don't book against christmas make sure that they are not against these three travel agencies because these guys don't honor and like our test bookings on them but you can go and uh, book against this large um, you know uh, uh, carrier because they are they are they are they're like okay it's okay if you take a few bookings from here and there for us right and don't do more than n number of bookings per day or per hour or during this slot all of those things and uh, okay so we tried our best we made sure that whenever we did a test booking we would we would book you know always select in in some sense uh, on our test page automatically the date selector was 6 months in advance so that people didn't you know select a date as today but it's quite common it, you, know, you need you need to have discipline to click on that next next 6 months in advance right it's so much easier to click today but uh, within i think 2 months of our project uh, this our customer got a $20000 bill from a from an airline agency uh, for uh, for what for having raised the prices of that uh, of their airline for a particular day because somehow our one of our test program went and did lots of bookings and lots of cancellations for that particular day and because of so many bookings and cancellations they thought that they are having a good time and they raised the prices because of the raised prices the customers who were actually wanting to book that day didn't book their flights so they lost revenue and that lost revenue they sent us a bill <laughs> right so you see what's happening it's it's really silly right that uh, that for building software 
you can't put in a software check for things like this right you can easily put a check at the service level which will check these rules for you so that you don't have to write these checklists and you don't have to send emails to people saying do it it will just reject your booking if it doesn't fall into this category how big or difficult a task this is it isn't right but it's not so obvious for some reason every time like when you discuss things like this oh yeah i know i know you know exercising is good for me <laughs> but do it <laughs> like you know, don't think so much about it <laughs> keyboard shortcuts another example if you notice um, uh, in desktop applications we have this feature where you can press alt and then the accelerator and n is highlighted and o is highlighted and c is highlighted it's a good feature we all as programmers love you know having to use the keyboard rather than using the mouse there is a, a problem there what happens is when you translate this into other languages the translator actually translates these menu items and how you how you actually put an underline is you put an ampersand sign in before the character for which you want the accelerator to be specified now that accelerator uh, ampersand is actually put by the translators for the language that they are because they see this file and say oh yeah i have to put this ampersand but the translator doesn't understand a where is it going to be used what's the menu option and and the most important characteristic of these are that they have to be unique for a menu right you can't have two of them both with n when you press alt n which one is going to be hit so so how do you sort of catch this defect right translator send these files back to you and now in french language there are three characters which i have got the underline and write under the same because they both all three start with the same character in that language it's quite it's quite common actually for something like this to happen but who's going to go and check this how many people are going to sit and test in each language whether the accelerator keys are the same so you put in a script the script's job is very simple go through each translation file scan and check that for a menu are all the values different don't don't you know like don't waste time doing things yourself <clears throat> so the point i guess uh, that i've been trying to get awareness and build uh, into people here is to say that whenever you sit down to think about writing a bold font email whenever you are sitting and creating a checklist for your team whenever you are thinking at some point in time that you know what should i tell these people never to do this all over again so pause and think can you firstly change the process in such a manner that the mistakes will not happen again if that's not possible can you create a warning poker yoke which will catch that mistake the moment it happens think about it if you think that's possible go ahead and create it if that's not possible then think about whether you think the email is important thank you people you can visit my blog there are lots of examples of poker yog there in software and a, a much more detailed explanation than i could possibly give today <coughs> any questions sorry i'm out of time but you can ask me questions still <laughs>